Today we're going to be looking at the new version of Blender 4.3, which has a lot of awesome new features coming. We're going to be highlighting the best of them, including some drastic performance improvements to the viewport, some crazy cool new geometry nodes features, and also some of the updates we're getting to make EV even better. Let's dive in. First up is going to be the Vulkan experimental rendering. So Vulkan is going to be replacing OpenGL, and you can currently turn it on under the preferences under experimental options. Now, if you don't know what Vulkan is, as it replaces OpenGL, it's going to enable multi-threaded support, have a lower CPU overhead, reducing the load on GPU, and also allowing them to have direct control over GPU memory allocation. Now, those were a lot of technical words, but what it basically means is it's going to improve the speed of everything, especially when working in the viewport. So this is something to be very excited about if you're working on a lower end machine. Before we move on to the next section, if you liked any of the footage I just showed, it's from my short film Watermelon Girl, which is up on Suzanne Awards to vote for now. I'll put a link in the description below. Next up, let's talk about some new features in Eevee. So light and shadow linking are coming to Eevee. If you don't know what this is, I have a full tutorial on it, but essentially it allows you to create groups of lights and objects that only impact one another. So a great use of this, for example, is if you have a character and you want to have a really good backlight or some interesting colors on your character, but you don't want that to ruin the entire scene, then you can go ahead and use light and shadow linking. Now, getting this in Eevee is a big deal because it's going to give you a lot more creative control and allow you to do some really interesting things with the lighting. Now, this is a big one I'm excited for, and I'll show you how I'm going to use it. But Blender Geometry Nodes now supports grease pencil data, treating grease pencil geometry as layers with curves that can have custom attributes. Many existing curve related nodes are updated to work with geometry pencil data, processing each layer independently. To enable curve editing, grease pencil can be converted to curves and back using specific conversion nodes. Although the conversion isn't fully lossless, attributes and materials are maintained. These nodes allow grease pencil to be used as an input for generating other geometry types and creating grease pencil data from scratch. Putting this in a real world example, when I was using Watermelon Girl, I actually used grease pencil to draw some curves and then went frame by frame and converted every grease pencil object into a curve and then converted that back into a rope so that I could do some of these kind of hair animations with her yarn hair. With geometry nodes, I could have just simply done a quick grease pencil animation in 2D and then converted it into a rope. So you can see how powerful this is going to be. And I'm extremely excited to see what the Blender community comes up with, with effects and other things. Likewise, another big feature coming to geometry nodes is now we can bake simulation nodes and pack them. So with pack bakes and simulation nodes, we can make it easier to save and share blends that utilize simulation nodes. For example, I have the dynamic VFX pack, which you can check out in the link below. And what we could do is pack certain bakes or preset animations and pass those off much easier than we could in the past when utilizing simulation nodes. Now, nobody likes UV unwrapping in 3D, but thankfully through this new version of Blender, it just got a little bit better because we have a new method called minimum stretch. Now, this is an iterative method, meaning that it will do it multiple times to try and find the best solution, and it'll try and minimize the stretch of your UVs. If you don't know what stretches in your UVs, that's when certain parts of your map are stretched out compared to their position in 3D space, and thus you end up with these weird low resolution areas. So this is a great way to get higher quality unwraps in less time. Now, if you follow any other 3D engines, you'll know that some 3D engines such as Redshift always have beautiful metals and HDR lighting. Well, we're getting a new metal BSDF node that'll make it easier to get more realistic metals. What this is, is an advanced metal node that will provide some additional metallic options for those that want to fine tune the control. So we get an F82 tint conductor with Fresnel approximation, which is currently in use by the principal BSDF, but we get more control here. And then we also get a conductor Fresnel, which was previously limited to only being able to use OSL scripts. So this gives you more control over your metal materials. Now noise nodes play a large role in procedural texturing, so it's always exciting when we get some new tools within this space, and they're adding a Gaber noise node to the shader menu. So this is similar to the cloud noise you might've seen over in the texture menu in the properties panel, but now we have access to it within the shader menu and we can control it there. This is really exciting. This is a type of noise node used in many other apps. I personally use Substance Designer to design a lot of my procedural materials and then import them into Blender. 
And it's exciting to see a lot of these tools getting natively imported into Blender so that we can create stronger procedural materials in the future without ever having to leave the app. If you've ever used brushes in Blender, you know that they can sometimes be a bit finicky with how they're stored and imported between projects. Well, now brushes are going to be stored in specific asset libraries that are shared across all projects, instead of having to copy them over to each Blender file. This should help reduce bloat within Blender files and also reduce load time. If you've ever had to use a lot of texture brushes, you know that they can quickly bloat your files and really slow down the opening time. So this is a welcome change that's very user-friendly. A great quality of life is they're adding a bone eyedropper. So if you've ever added constraints or drivers and you're trying to select a bone, you know you have to go through the armature in this big list. Well, now they just have an eyedropper. You can drag it over the bone in the 3D viewport, click it, and it'll automatically fill out that entire list. Now, one of the biggest additions we've ever seen to Eevee is we now have multi-pass compositing support for Eevee. This is huge. Now, a lot of people get really focused on trying to improve things in the viewport, and they don't realize that a lot of the magic happens in the compositing phase. This is really where I see artists go from amateur to professional when they learn how to utilize the post-processing phase. Now, don't worry if you're not familiar with that phase. Glev Alexandrov from Creative Shrimp actually just released a new free course that goes through this. It's only about two hours long, and it's just jam-packed with information on how to composite, color grade, and to improve the image quality of your renders after you've completed them. He also uses an entirely free software pipeline, so it's easy to follow along with and completely free. Definitely recommend checking that out. It's a great way to improve all of your renders.